Good morning, everyone. First thing I want to do is invite you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, please. Luke chapter 24. This morning we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And to the early Christians, the resurrection of Jesus was not something that they just focused their minds on in a special way once a year. The resurrection was something that permeated their lives. In fact, that they built their lives upon. And every time the church would gather on the first day of the week, they would have a special celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Let's begin by reading Luke chapter 24. This is going to take about five minutes, so let's slow down and read it together. Luke 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the mo Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they didn't believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they didn't find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they didn't see. And he said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. 
But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. What a great passage of scripture. The resurrection. Let's pray before we dive into our lesson. Our Heavenly Father and our Creator, we bow before you in awe of this story that we just read. Father, as you did for Mary and as you did for the men on the road to Emmaus and the apostles and early disciples, open our eyes to the Scriptures. Help us to see your glory. Help us to be transformed by your words this morning. Father, let the meditation of all of our minds and the words of my lips today be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This is our prayer in the risen King Jesus' name. Amen. Instead of going through verse by verse, which would be uh, worthwhile to do, uh, we're going to instead highlight four themes about the resurrection from Luke chapter 24. Four themes. First of all, Jesus' resurrection is the paradigm-shattering historical event. Second of all, Jesus' resurrection is the key to understanding all of Scripture. Thirdly, Jesus' resurrection is the powerful message that we should preach to save the world. And lastly, the resurrection is the proof that Jesus is truly the King of the universe. Let's take them in turn. First of all, the resurrection is the paradigm-shifting historical event. The world of modern secular academia uh, that has a scientific explanation for everything and that, that explains everything by what they can see and what they can test and all of that has tried to reg uh, relegate the re resurrection accounts to representative stories. Uh, these stories really didn't happen scholars sometimes say they're just symbolic. They speak of higher truths. The resurrection is not about Jesus bodily raising from the dead, because stuff like that doesn't happen today. No, no, the resurrection is teaching us higher truths about hope springing eternal and about forgiveness. And these apostles, they had a feeling of the presence of Jesus there with them. The resurrection is about how the spring always comes after the winter and how we should always have hope. But we just read that. Is that the sense that you got when you read through Luke chapter 24, that these were just symbolic stories, representative stories of higher spiritual truths? Take that last one there when Jesus just appears before the apostles and they think he's a spirit. And Jesus says, no, 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 look at my hands and look at my feet. Come over here and touch me. By the way, do you have anything to eat? And then he eats fish in front of them. What, what, what spiritual lesson are we to learn from that? What symbolic uh, message 
Are, are we to glean from Jesus having fish and chips with his disciples that day? I think the point is not symbolic. I think the point is Jesus is trying to get them to see, hey, it's me. It's Jesus. You know me. I'm really here. I'm not a spirit. I'm not just an impression in your mind. I'm not a symbol. It's me in the flesh. Touch me. Touch my hands. Give me some food to eat. Why would you include something like this? Give me some food to eat. Some broiled fish. Why would you include that? Seems almost a, 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 a trivial detail. Well, perhaps because that's the way it happened. There are so many wonderful evidences that we have that the resurrection is a historical event. I just want to outline three that we can see right here in the text. First of all, the initial witnesses to the empty tomb are women, not just in Luke, but in all of the Gospels. Now, ladies, in the first century, a woman's testimony was not admissible in court, either in Roman or Jewish jurisprudence. And you can even see in verse 11, the women come and tell the apostles, and they regarded their news as utter nonsense, an idle tale, they say. Let me quote a man from the second century. This is a guy named Celsus. He was a Greek philosopher, and he was an outspoken critic of Christianity. He was one of the first ones to actually write uh, a critique, of an intellectual critique of, of Christianity. Mark you, these are the words of Celsus, not Jerome. I quote, How can anyone expect rational men to listen to the testimony of a hysterical female? Yes, these were misogynistic times. A woman's testimony wasn't worth anything. It was thrown out. But what Celsus saw as discrediting the faith is actually evidence that Luke here is telling the truth. Think about this. If Luke or if someone a hundred years after Luke is trying to create a myth, trying to create a legend that Jesus rose from the dead, He's trying to convince people of this new, you know, uh, this new um, truth that Jesus rose from the dead. Why would he write in that the first witnesses were women? The only reason for that, this only makes sense, is if that's the way it actually happened, and Luke is reporting the facts. Or how about this? As we read through the language of not just Luke 24, but John 20 and, and all the rest there. Matthew chapter 28 and Mark 16. The language of the resurrection accounts is written from the vantage point of eyewitnesses. Now, that's the way biographies are written, not legends. People who study this kind of thing, and there are wonderful New Testament scholars that actually handle the kind of manuscripts that are thousands of years old. People like Gary Habermas, you can look him up, Daniel B. Wallace, or Richard Baucom. Richard Baucom wrote a, a wonderful book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And in that book, he talks about how when people picked up the gospel accounts, they read them like biographies because it has all the hallmarks of of eyewitness testimony. See, when, le when legends were written in the ancient world, they were written from the point of view of an omniscient narrator, a person who can see everything. He sees the view at 30,000 feet. But each one of these stories in Luke 24 are written from the limited point of view of people who were there. Look at, you know, why, did you notice why Luke, he's including these, these, these very specific names of people. Look in verse 10. You've got Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James. You've got one of the two men on the road to Emmaus. His name is Cleopas. Why would you include these very specific names? Well, in ancient historical documents that are giving eyewitness accounts, biographical documents, Names functioned like footnotes in the text. The idea was, this is Luke's way of saying, hey, if you want to go check this out, if you want to investigate the veracity of this story, these are the people you go and talk to. Pack your bags, go to Jerusalem, look up Mary Magdalene. Go talk to Cleopas. 
He, he saw this happen. You can go talk to him. In fact, that's probably where Luke got these stories. He interviewed these people. That's what he says at the beginning of his gospel, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, how he, how he you know, the source of his, his, in, his information was through interviewing people who were eyewitnesses. And this is what Paul does in his great chapter on the resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried, was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared first to Cephas, Peter, and then to the apostles, and then he says to 500 people at one time, most of whom are still living. And the idea, again, is you don't believe me, Go to Jerusalem, talk to these people. The third piece of evidence that this is a historical event is that monotheistic Jews are found in verse 52 worshiping a human being as God. It says, and they worshiped him in verse 52. Now remember, the gospel accounts were written within the lifetime of many of these eyewitnesses. In Paul's letter, like 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's letters also were written within the lifetime of many of these eyewitnesses. And these people, the, the very first Christians, were Jewish. Now, Jewish people are the last people on the face of this earth to be open to the idea that a human being could be God. And yet, immediately, they are found worshiping a man as God. How did that happen? And it happened overnight, and not over a few generations like myths and legends do, where you know, it takes root in a culture and then it takes several generations to hash out you know, what this legend is about. No, 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 this happened literally overnight. On the first day of the week, people started worshiping Jesus as God. Something must have happened that shattered their worldview of everything they th that they thought was possible, that changed everything. What could it be? Could it be that they saw him alive? What's the point? What's the point I'm trying to make? The resurrection was preached in the first century in the early church as a historical fact. Facts are inconvenient and they're stubborn and they're irritating, but there they are. What's that? That's a fact. What do you got to do with the fact? You got to face the facts. You can't argue with the facts. You have to accept them. It's foolish to reject them. Hey, our culture is not about facts. Our culture is about likes and dislikes and little heart emojis and everything. That's what our culture is. It's not about facts. Paul, the apostle, before he was persecuting Christians, he was offended by Jesus. He was offended by the whole idea of this gospel that Jesus claims to be the Son of God and, and claims to be the Messiah and that he dies on the cross and he was looking to stamp out Christianity. He was offended by all of this. And then he saw Jesus raised from the dead on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And suddenly, his opinion doesn't matter. Paul's likes and his dislikes don't matter anymore because he saw the resurrected Jesus. And that's what makes him such a credible witness. Or our culture, we, we read something and we decide whether we believe it or not through likes and dislikes. I like this about it, I don't like this about it. A lot of people read their Bibles that way. I like this part of the Bible, but you know, I just, I really don't like that story in the Bible. I don't, I don't, I don't like that that happened in the Bible. I don't like uh, that, that teaching of Jesus. It's offensive to me. I don't like what Jesus has to say about money. I don't like what Jesus has to say about sex and how I use my body. None of that matters. Put all of the ethical teaching aside. Focus in on this. Was Jesus raised from the dead or not? If Jesus was raised from the dead, and that's a fact, then does it matter what we think about the teaching of Jesus? Or about this story, about that story? If he wasn't raised from the dead, then don't vex yourself about it. But the way that it's presented here, and I think that there's a mountain of evidence that Jesus, in fact, was raised from the dead. And we should preach that as a historical fact. Second of all, the resurrection is the key to understanding all of Scripture, all of Scripture. The resurrection 
and the scripture actually explain each other. See, what happens to Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, was very strange. It was an enigma to people. They didn't understand it. But what happened to Jesus could only be understood in light of the scriptures. And yet, the scriptures themselves could only be truly understood in light of what happened to Jesus. The two are mutually informing. Look at verses 6 through 8. Remember the angels that are there talking to the women? He is not here. Remember what they said in verse 6. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his word. Jesus explicitly told them on several occasions that he would suffer, that he would die, that he would be crucified and that he would rise on the third day. He told them over and over and over again. He prepared them for that. But they didn't understand it in the moment until after it happened. Why? Because nobody thought that that was possible, that someone could be raised from the dead. The Jews, most of the Jews, minus the Sadducees and maybe some others, but most of the Jews believed in a future bodily resurrection, but they believed it would come at the end of time. But for one human, to be raised bodily from the dead, never to die again, right there, smack dab in the middle of history, unthinkable. And it was only when they could see it, when they can touch him, when they can eat with him, then they could grasp what they thought was impossible. The cross, the cross is understood in light of the resurrection as well. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is this one in the middle here in Luke 24. This this story about these two guys on the road to Emmaus. Did Did you pick up on all the irony? They're informing Jesus of the great news that went on in Jerusalem concerning himself. And Jesus is acting like Columbo there. What news? What are you talking about? You know, it's packed with irony. Look at verses 19 and 20. Do they say concerning Jesus, this man who is a prophet, mighty indeed, word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests, they, they, they delivered him over to be crucified. Verse 21, but we had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. Did you get it? In their minds, a crucified Messiah was a failed Messiah. They were looking for a redemption like in the book of Exodus or what Judas Maccabeus was looking forward to in 1 Maccabees chapter 4, which in fact a battle at Emmaus took place there 150 years uh, before this story. They were looking for this mighty prophet to march into Jerusalem with spears to to, to storm the the, the fortress right there, uh, overlooking the, the, the temple, to grab the spears, to overcome the guards, to kill the Romans, to liberate the people of God. That's what they were looking for. But then the cross, the cross shattered all of their hope of redemption. But it was precisely through the cross that Jesus accomplished redemption. It was a redemption unlooked for. The very thing that they thought made Jesus a failure turned out the thing that made him a victor. But the point we're trying to make here is where did Jesus go to explain God's plan of redemption? Where did he go? Verse 25 through 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He had to go back and retell the story. Of course, the resurrection, everybody was wrong about Jesus, but the resurrection now vindicates Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus again, three times in the story. Look, the last story here, verse 44 through 47. He's walking them through the scriptures. These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to the scriptures and he started walking them through the text. Because the cross made no sense. What kind of a Messiah dies? Messiah means chosen one, anointed one of God. And yet here's Jesus, naked, alone, forsaken, humiliated, weak. He's dying like one who is cursed. What kind of salvation could a dead Messiah achieve? So the resurrected Jesus has to say, let's go back and look at the scriptures. 
Wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall and hear Jesus' sermon about himself? interpreting all the Old Testament texts. Who knows what text that he went to. Maybe he went to the book of Isaiah. Hey, remember that glorious king that we, of Isaiah part one? Well, that's the same guy as that suffering servant of Isaiah part two. You see, he wasn't suffering for the sins that he committed. He was suffering for the sins of other people, and he died as a sacrifice. Who knows what other scriptures, whatever themes that he brought into it. Hey, that sacrificial system. Did you really think that all the, the, the blood of, of bulls and goats, do you really think that they could truly cover and atone for your sins? No, 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 that was all pointing to me. The temple, the presence of God, the ark, the feasts, the exodus, exodus the, the promises to Abraham and to David, they're all pointing to me. The point is only after Jesus is raised from the dead can we see all of God's promises are yes in him. The whole vista of God's eternal plan opens up when we read it in light of the resurrection. And our hearts will burn within us as we go back over the Old Testament. Our eyes will be opened to the scriptures finally when we read them through the cross and the resurrection together. Have you ever seen the movie The Sixth Sense with, with uh, uh, Haley Joe Osment and uh, Bruce Willis? You got to watch the movie twice, don't you? The first time you watch, I remember my parents took me to the movie theater, the Linda Movie Theater in Akron, Ohio. I remember it. And I was utterly shocked, just like the rest of the world, a huge plot twist at, uh, plot twist at the end. I'm not spoiling it. You guys know Bruce Willis, the hero, he's dead the whole time. He's dead. Uh, if I spoiled that for you, that movie came out like 20 years ago, so, you know, you should get on with it. It's the opposite of the gospel. You find out the hero is dead at the end. In the gospel, you find out the hero that was dead is alive. That's beside the point. The second time you watch Sixth Sense, you can't help but watch every single scene in light of the ending, right? I mean, you pick up all these details that you missed all along the way because you were looking in the wrong direction. You, weren't, you, weren't, you, you didn't have the ending in mind. You know, when Paul, uh, when he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, he changes his life. He says just in an offhand way in Galatians 1, 17, that he went away to Arabia. Well, I wonder what Paul was doing out there in the desert. I like to think he was reading his Bible and thinking, oh, oh. Oh, the scriptures came alive as, we, as, as, as Paul and as we read them through the resurrection. Third point, the, the resurrection is the powerful message to save the world. Look at these, these stories, each one of them. The minute somebody finds out the good news that Jesus has been raised from the dead, what do they do? They run and they go tell somebody else, Right? The women, verse 9, they go and tell the apostles. Uh, ver verse 35, these, these men who were moving away from Jerusalem, they have the good news that Jesus is raised from the dead, and what do they do? They run all the way back to Jerusalem and go talk to the apostles. And then, of course, you have the Great Commission, where Jesus is sending his apostles out into the world to go and proclaim the message, forgiveness of sins, repentance, because good news Nobody sits on this message of the gospel. Before, the identity of Jesus had to be kept under wraps. You know, scholars call this the messianic secret. But after the resurrection, hey, the floodgates are open. It's a bit like what Jesus said in Matthew 9, or Mark 9 and verse 9, after his transfiguration. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Now, go out and tell the world. Right? The resurrection gives us good news to preach to other people. It makes the news about Jesus' death good. And so that's why when you read the second volume of Luke's work, the book of Acts, it was central to the proclamation of the good news. The resurrection dominates all of the sermons 
of Peter and of Paul. What is Peter saying in Acts chapter 2 on that first Pentecost after the resurrection? The Jesus whom you killed and crucified, God raised him up on the third day. He made him Lord. He made him Christ. Acts chapter 3, same thing. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5 when they stood trial. Acts chapter 10 in the household of Cornelius. It's the resurrection through and through. Paul now comes on the scene. He goes to the synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia and he preaches the resurrection. He goes to Athens, to the pagans in Greece. What is he preaching? Jesus and the resurrection. He's held, uh, you know, in court before the Roman tribunal. And what does he say? He says, I'm on trial here for the hope of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. How did the gospel spread through hostile territory, through pagan territory, Greco-Roman, uh, you know, territory, against all odds? Because... It was a unique message because of the resurrection. That's what our faith is founded upon. It changes everything about what we thought we knew about the world, about our bodies, about life and death, about God. It changes everything. It gave people a foundation to believe that judgment was coming, that salvation was coming. It gave people motivation to, to change the way that they live their lives and the way that they think. It gave them motivation to love their neighbor as themselves. The resurrection gives us good news and it also gives us hope. What day did this happen on, this resurrection? Did you catch it in chapter 24 and verse 1? The first day of the week. The first day of the week. This comes out even more in John's Gospel. Deliberate echoes of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he began there on that first day, didn't he? Well, here, God is signaling a new creation. A new creation is coming. And that first act of renewal was the physical body of the Son of God. He would not abandon him to Sheol. He would not let his Holy One see corruption and decay. And Paul says in the beautiful chapter on the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, paraphrasing here, but Paul says what God did for Jesus, he would also do for all those who belong to Jesus. Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, the firstborn of the dead. He's a pattern for many more after him. Death no longer gets the last word. In this hope, Paul says in Romans 8, in this hope you were saved. The resurrection of Jesus certified that future. His, his body, a living, breathing signpost pointing to what God would do for us, what God would do for creation. There's going to be a resurrection. Everybody's going to be resurrected, the just and the unjust. But those who belong to him, those who have faith in Jesus, who have joined with Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection and baptism through faith, they're going to inherit a new world, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. No pain, no mourning, no tears, and certainly no death. Those are the former things. They belong to an old age that's passing away. Behold, God says, I am making all things new. So the resurrection of Jesus is that stake in the ground of history that marked an end of an age where death reigned through sin, but no longer does now. Because in Jesus' resurrection, God's future is made real, is brought straight into the present. Nobody really knew what happened after death. It was a great mystery. People feared it because no one had come back to tell us about it until now. Now we have good news. We have hope. We have victory. How could these Christians face Roman jail cells, Roman swords, Roman lions, Roman crosses without fear? These very ones? Because they knew Jesus was raised. How did they know? Because they saw him it happened. It's a fact because they believed it. They staked their lives upon it. They had died with Christ. Now Christ lives in them. You can't kill a man who's already died to himself. You can't control a person through fear when the fangs of death have been removed because that's what Jesus did in the cross. The cross was the worst that the world could hurl at him. 
It was the worst that the world could do. And what did Jesus do in the resurrection? He turned all that evil back on itself. You guys familiar with judo? The sport of judo? It's taking all the energy of your opponent and then turning it back on themselves and flattening them to the ground. If we could not be irreverent by saying this, the cross and the resurrection was divine judo. Jesus transformed all of the evil. Human allied with satanic. He absorbed it and he defeated it simultaneously. Not only did he defeat the powers of evil, he actually made the powers of evil into his agents of victory and their own defeat. He turned evil against itself to its own demise. What's the point? The resurrection stands underneath this powerful message of the gospel. It's what gives it substance. It's what makes it good news. It's what gives us hope and, and victory. Believe in it. Do you believe that Jesus raised from the dead? Share it. Live it out in your life until all of creation is filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Very quickly, the last point is the resurrection is proof that Jesus is king. Three, three times Jesus is described as the king here in chapter 24. The angels call him the son of man in verse 7, a technical term taken from the book of Daniel, meaning the, the most powerful human ruler that inherits God's, uh, God's rule over the nations. And twice Jesus refers to himself as Christ or Messiah, which of course to the Jews meant king, verse 26 and 46. Jesus exits the scene as king, reigning from heaven over all of creation. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. And he will reign until all the enemies are put under his feet, death itself being the last enemy. So he's not done yet. My fellow Americans, we don't like kings in this country, do we? But we've got to get with the program here. C.S. Lewis, in a great essay called, I think it was called Equality, he, he believed in, in democracy, a lot like we do, but not because we're so wise and we make such good choices and because we're able to rule ourselves. No, he, he said, I believe in democracy for precisely the opposite reason, because we're all sinners and no one can be trusted with unchecked power. So democracy is good, Lewis says, in the same way that medicine is good because we're sick, or the same way that clothes are good because we're no longer innocent. Democracy is medicine, but democracy is not food. It's not the ideal. We were meant to be ruled, but we've never had a king fit to rule us, who has our interests and in, who truly loves us. Well, finally, through the resurrection, we have a king who's fit to rule. We have, we have the king that, that our hearts have always longed for. A king who loves us so much that he poured out his own life for us. A king who protects us with his own broken body. A king who guides us with his divine wisdom. Who provides for us by his power. Who fights for us with his strength. Who listens to us with compassion. But never forget that he bought us and he redeemed us by his own blood. We are not our own. As Paul says, we were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Bow the knee to your sovereign king. Why? Because he was resurrected from the dead. That's why. Obey your king. Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Whether or not you like it, it doesn't matter. He's your king. And it's always for your good. Trust your king. No matter what circumstances come in your life, trust him, rely on him through that, whether or not you understand what's going on. He's your king. Treat him as king. Pray to him as your king and expect to be heard because he's a king who answers prayer. And whether his answer is yes or no, or hey, you're asking the wrong thing here, or wait a while, it's always good, it's always right, it's always wise. Expect great things from your king.
Thou art coming to a king, John Newton says. Large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. Why? Because the Lord is risen indeed. I hope and pray that you believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And I hope these words in Luke chapter 24 have reached into your life and have changed the way you look at everything. And I hope that there's a renewal happening in your heart and in your mind right now through these words. Before we end, let's pray together. Our great Creator and our great God in heaven, by your wisdom and, and your, your eternal plan, you knew we needed a Savior and a King. You provided the sacrifice for our sins and gave us the King that we've always longed for. We're so thankful for Jesus today. We're so thankful that he died to take away our sins and that he was raised to give us new life and that in him we can find a life that goes beyond this life, an eternal life. In him we can be with all those who love him, will never be separated again, never be in pain again, and we can inherit new bodies that will not age, but will last for the ages to come. Father, we look forward to the time when we'll be with you forever and help us to have faith in the meanwhile. In Jesus' name, amen. I appreciate so much your kind attention, and we invite all of our members, of course, at 1130 to take part in the Lord's Supper in our Zoom meeting. Thank you.